Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event. My name is Marion Wallace and I am the British Library Curator for the Khadija Say In This Space We Breathe exhibition here at the British Library. This extraordinary series of photographic self-portraits is the work of Khadija Say, a young British Gambian artist. To produce these works, she photographed herself using the wet collodion process, a 19th century technique, which has resulted in evocative, blurred, in some cases, almost ethereal photographs. In each image, she holds a different object. Most are of spiritual significance and all of them link with Gambian culture. This evening, we're going to dig deeper into the history and meanings of these objects. Please do come and see the exhibition for yourself. It's free and at the moment, advanced booking is necessary via our website. Now, let me introduce the co-curator of the exhibition, Khadija George Sasse. Khadija is a, is a literary activist, writer, editor, and co-founder of Mboka Festival for Arts, Culture, and Sport, and a PhD candidate at Brighton University researching Black British publishers and Pan-Africanism. She has received several awards for her work in the creative arts, and it's been a pleasure working with her. Khadija, over to you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Mar Marion. And um, my name's Khadija, so good evening, everyone, and salam alaikum. Thank you for joining us for this very special event in which we share personal and cultural insights on the work of Khadija Say, who died in the Grenfell Tower at the age of 24 with her mother and 70 other people in June 2017. This evening, you will be hearing from artist and social historian Nicola Green, who was her mentor and co-curator of the Diaspora Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and founder of Khadija Say Arts at Inter University. And we're also going to be hearing from Malik Jeng, who is the co-director of Yaram Arts and Mboka Festival and a consultant on Gambian and Senegambian arts and culture. So Nicola is going to talk briefly about Khadija and her work and some of her processes. And Malik is going to talk a little bit about Gambian society and traditions. And as we move through the images, they're both going to talk from the personal aspect and from the cultural aspect. So you're getting a totally rounded vision of what Khadija was aiming to do. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So you will have opportunities to, not to ask me, <laughs> but to ask Malik or Nicola anything that, that you'd like. So first of all, Nicola, could you talk a little bit about how you knew Khadija and a little bit about her work, please? Sorry, just unmuted. Thank you, Khadija, thank you very much. Um, so I met Khadija back in 2014. I had curated a part of the Discerning Eye exhibition, which was an open call exhibition for uh, emerging artists. And Khadija had put in a series of work that was her, actually the work she'd made for her degree show. And she had just recently graduated. It was a series called Crowned, which were photographic images of her, her friends and family, all women. And I had just, um, my husband and I had just adopted our third child at the time, a girl. And I was thinking very much about, as a white mother, thinking about my daughter's, my black daughter's experience um, uh, in many ways, but not least her hair and thinking uh, about how important her hair is. And, 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 and so um, Khadija and I had amazing conversations about her work, but what, what really happened was that she, uh, she stood at the opening night with her mother Mary right next to her work uh, all night and she uh, kind of um, uh, in a very quiet but determined way she she challenged me and she told me about her experience going getting a scholarship to rugby um, 
uh, sixth form, where she was kind of really flabbergasted by the sort of effortlessness of the ambition and kind of um, uh, ideas of all the children that she was at school found herself at school with that that whatever that, that that they just assumed that whatever they were going to do they were su succeeding and there she was having finished her degree um, she had taken out a loan to make the frames for these works and she she said to me you know I'm working as a care full-time as a care assistant like my mom and I don't see how I'm ever going to pay back the loan just for these frames and she was like I I I saw in those um those other six formers, I saw the, the kind of level of ambition that I could have, and I, but I, 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 I need help as to how I can sort of achieve that. And she then came to my studio and she worked in my studio. And not long afterwards, I, um, David A. Bailey, the curator came to me and said that he had got some funding for some artists to go to Okwe's Venice Biennale. And would I, find some funding to bring some artists along for networking events. And so I did, and Khadija was one of the young artists that I mentored that we took to Venice back in 2015. And that resulted in uh, myself and David A. Bailey um, founding the Diaspora Pavilion, which came to pass in 2017. And Khadija was the youngest um, emerging artist in the Diaspora Pavilion in Venice. And um, she was, um, and, and the only exhibition she'd had was that discerning eye exhibition. And she, she made these nine tintypes um, for that exhibition in Venice. It was a huge, massive deal for her to have to uh, be exhibiting in Venice alongside some of her heroes and heroines and in the art world. And, um, but that process uh, uh, of making those works and the kind of what she was experiencing kind of concurrently to all of that excitement in her personal life um, led to her kind of uh, soul searching very deeply um, and, and a kind of um, incredible journey that I was sort of lucky enough to go on with her, uh, which resulted in these works. And they really are a kind of exploration actually uh, of her faith in all kinds of ways, as well as her heritage and kind of, and, and her ancestry and her desire to kind of understand her mixed religious heritage from her father and her mother her Gambian heritage, which was very important to her, her West African heritage, and, and her heritage as a black woman from the continent of Africa, all of those things kind of came into this work. Um, uh, so I think I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> yeah, because then we're gonna hear a little bit more from you as we move through the images about her life and then the processes of what she was going through those as well. But that is a lovely introduction Thank you so much to help us understand where she was coming from when she was uh, making that work. So Malik, could you talk a little bit about Gambian uh, society and traditions, please? Thank you, Khadija. Well, Gambian society is like um, one extended family where people are interrelated across uh, different faiths. It is a population of over 90% Muslims, but most would have attended schools that were run by Christian missionaries. Um, in a typical day in the Gambia, one would experience um, the Muslim call to prayers, azan, or short bells ringing. There is this coexistence where from both religious um, events, let's say the Christian festivities and feasts and Islamic ones are celebrated by all people. It is, for instance, like um, when Muslims observe like Eid al-Fitr or Eid al where it is local, which is locally called Korite and um, Tobaski, they will open their homes to their Christian friends, families, and neighbors. Likewise, um, Christians would do the same would reciprocate this over Easter and, um, and Christmas. Um, so this um, 
even well to add when you have like um, these big Christian sort of um, 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 celebrations, apart from the church services and perhaps other religious activities, the Muslim men and women are the main people you see that mark the occasion with cultural events and, and other activities in the main. So um, this natural flow seamlessly connecting and living together is what sort of defines the African. Obviously, um, I'm not oblivious that in the recent past, there's been a bit of uneasiness, um, but that I would regard as a byproduct of political expediency because Gambia went through um, a dictatorship for two decades and religion was, amongst other things, tested. Um, but the bond and legacy that has built over the years, I'm so holds true and will continue to hold. So coming to um, sort of the cultural and um, indigenous practices, rituals, and, um, and, and, and objects, most of them carry spiritual significance and have multi-layered meanings and relevance. Um, can you say his family, I mean, her parents, Ajay, who unfortunately also was killed in the uh, Greenfield fire, tower fire, and then her dad would have definitely grow up in that era with where I'm trying, what Gambia I'm trying to portray here, when, when this was much even stronger. So, so they would have these values and ready to be able to introduce their child or instill some of these things to, 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 uh, to her. So now being a diaspora herself, um, where you have different challenges, in, 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 in the West, um, being grounded or being availed that sort of treasure is something when she faces sort of this new, as she pointed out, when she faces trauma, she can tap into and explore this um, cultural heritage, not only to inspire her work, not only to inspire her work to do sort of interesting stuff, but to embolden and strengthen her character to, 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 to face these challenges. But before I leave, I would also want to add that the way I see some of the objects presented by her is a bit of an oddity. It's so surreal that uh, perhaps maybe she's also provoking something unknown. So, but as we progress into this program, maybe we would respond to those. I think that is totally right what you said. That's what Marion and I were thinking when we were curating. And yeah. also we have on it, you see it as an oddity. For us, it is like this brave woman, thank you. <laughs> That's how we saw it. This brave woman, thank you. But yeah. as you were talking, you were really making me miss Gambia. Ah. Oh. So, <laughs> but anyway, what we're going to do now, and we're gonna make other people miss Gambia as we talk about that. So you can yeah. see how rich the culture was, and then we've got to understand not only the strength of Khadija through this, but why she held onto her culture to get her through things. It was very grounding. And I think that happens with a lot of people's cultures. So for people in the diaspora, when they can ground to their culture, it really is supportive for them. And I think this is what Khadija has done and challenged it at the same time. This is great. So what we're gonna do is the first image we're going to look at and have a discussion around is Sosun. Um, so maybe Nicola, is there anything you can tell us about what Khadija was thinking doing when this was being made? Well, so Khadija made nine sort of scenes, if you like, uh, all of which are, 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 you can see in the nine silkscreen prints. Uh, but each one, because she was making them as tintypes, that each tintype is completely unique. And she made a few of each tintypes. Um, and so there was a process when, when, when she was 
where she had to decide which which pieces she was going to put in uh, when she'd finished them all uh, uh, to the to the diaspora pavilion, which pieces she was going to present, and um, so that was kind of that was quite a painful decision making process for uh, Khadija, and actually she was only able to exhibit six in the end, and that was incredibly painful for her choosing which six. Uh, but then further to that, um, I had uh, I made um, uh, with her and Matthew Rich at Jealous Silkscreen Printers a, a silkscreen print of one of the images. And um, so deciding which one to choose as a silkscreen print uh, was really <laughs> uh, hard for her. Uh, but she decided on this, this image, So Chu. And uh, I think that that she did not decide on it necessarily because she felt it was necessarily the, the strongest image or her favorite. But I think that, that what she said was that, that well, this is the, um, in a way, I think she saw this maybe as the first image in the series. Uh, it's the one that she has her back to us. Uh, so in a way, it's the most shy image. Maybe it's kind of, if, if you see each one as reflecting different parts on one level of, of her. And, and um, she's kind of introducing us, if you like, to her world in this image. And we also, she talked uh, when, when, when um, I was with her and she was choosing this image, she talked about um, presenting herself as an artist too, because this was her presenting herself as an artist, not just as a photographer, but mm -hmm. as an artist to the world. And mm -hmm. she talked about afterwards, uh, uh, being at Venice, that she was visible and what an, in big deal this was to her and so I think this image also um uh there's a sort of idea that the 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 the, 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 the two sticks are um uh, the incense sticks uh Malik can tell us about a bit more about them but that they could almost be paintbrushes or pencils um that they that they they've got kind of multiple roles if you like they are healing object but they they this is this was sort of this was also, um, I think on some level, the beginning of her journey. Her journey. Thank you, that is a great start. So over to you, Malik. So what can you tell us about Sotu? And please correct <laughs> my pronunciation. Well, Sotu is, um, is slightly fading out a bit, to be honest, in, 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 in daily sort of Gambian life. But it is used um, purposely for dental health purposes, mainly for dental health. Apart from dental health, people also use it um, for cultural sort of dressing. If you properly dress, it would be the last piece missing. If you really, especially if you want to go back in history, perhaps in early sort of Gambian culture, women, when they fully dress and ready to go out, with their full gowns and grand move and all that, they would want to have a sochu with them that completes the full dress set. But um, nowadays it is more for dental health purposes to clean your, your teeth and all that. And also Islam itself recognize the, 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 that power of sochu in terms of dental health that it is reported that the prophet of Islam uh, said that um, had it not been that she doesn't want to be labeled the, 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 the faithful with too much, um, he would have insisted that, or he would have requested for people, just like they do their five daily prayers, to ensure that at any point in time they have a such social with them. Yes. That's so interesting. And these yeah. these were bought but, in London. So peeps, so they are still used in a way, I think, if, if uh, they're being imported and yes. uh, into the UK, so. And Nicola mentioned um, the artistic aspect mm -hmm. of Kadija thinking about Sochu in that way. The only sort of, again, I don't want to use oddity, but the, the provocation perhaps is why then she turned her back with the Sochu holding it with the left hand. Mm. But, uh, people normally face their up front and they have a Sochu in their mouth instead. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Display in Gambian culture. That's interesting. And do you think, Malik, because you know she's turned around, she's holding them, it's it feels to me also 
you know, what Khadija was saying, there's a little bit of um, a kind of a call to arms that she's holding. She, she's she's um, holding these in a different way to what would be expected and is normal. And that there's, there's um, she's really thinking about um, them in relation to her, to, to her as a woman, um, uh, to, to her, not just her as an artist, but her, her, her own faith, her healing, uh, but also her sense of how they're going to help her and how she's going to then go out a stronger and uh, into the world and kind of um, be a strong woman in the world. Do you, what do you think? Well, her femininity as a woman and an artistry definitely that fits in with the purpose of the Sochu. Uh, in terms of challenging the world, the provocation, I, I, I'm pressing myself to think why would she turn her back and hold it with the left hand? I'm thinking maybe, maybe, well, is, is she thinking whether these Sochus are of any use now? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're being, you're provoking us. You're provoking us, Malik. Okay, <laughs> let us look at the next image, Tere. So Nicola, what can you tell us, please, with this, this is a provoking image. So all, all of the objects in, in these nine uh, images were um, very, they are um, obviously quite universal in, in the Gambia, but they were uh, specifically personal to her in that those um, sochu sticks, these, these tere, the, these little prayer, the, um, folded up prayers, um, all of the objects uh, were in her parents' flat and came, many of them uh, came from her father, um, uh, who, is Mus who is Muslim um, and her mother who was Christian, uh, but they, they, were, they all came uh, from the Gambia and were brought over by her parents. And these, these little prayer, um, these are little um, verses from the Quran written on, on these bits of paper and what she, she has kind of strung them together and put them on her face, which of course is um, not, what you would normally do with them, as uh, Malik will tell us about. And I think uh, for me, this, you know, um, this is an incredibly powerful image. It's, um, uh, she's much bigger in, in, in her face is sort of, um, uh, there's less of her body in this image. It's all, a, and her, her eyes are closed and she's almost, she's kind of almost, uh, it praying, she, she's, she's literally kind of um, seeking um, the, uh, uh, I don't know, the wisdom, the faith kind of contained in, in these that have uh, come all the way from uh, the, the country of her heritage and, and um, there they are on her face. And uh, it's an incredible, incredibly powerful image, I think, about protection and is really kind of a, a, a strong manifestation of, of how much this work was, um, was actually an, 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 a literal act of, of, of faith on her part on, on, uh, uh, at every level. And um, I see the, you know, the way the conversations that I had with her while she was making them, you know, she, she nearly um, gave up for various reasons, nothing to do with, she was very far from a quitter, but nothing to do with her, but outside circumstances that in her personal life and uh, really difficult events that were going on for her. And so these, making these works was, became a kind of almost a matter of survival. And I think that the way that she's placed the objects um, on herself and on her body, she didn't go into a huge amount of detail, um, uh, kind of unraveling each part of that actually. Um, uh, but in a way it's all there in, in, in the images there. This is, this is um, it, it's incredibly, it's incredibly powerful. So let's come back to you on, on, on discussing some of that, Nicola, about um, her faith and uh, you know, how she used the objects. But, because uh, I actually found that image in some ways quite scary, <laughs> in a way. Uh, Malik, 
Can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about Tere, please? And again, give us a correct pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, it's Tere. Um, the Tere, in, on this occasion, if she took it uh, from her dad, that would spell that it would have been prepared by a Marabu who used Quranic texts on a, on a piece of paper. And, and this would be sewn into sort of a leather packet. And that's what she's had on her face. It is mainly for protection and, 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 and good fortune, but protection in particular. People believe in the theory so much that at times they feel that wearing the right theory, you know, you'll be immune against uh, anything like a bullet shot or knife stabbing and all what that. Um, but interestingly, before the Islamic angle, which is the ones he has, that is the ones that the Marabus would prepare, Teres are mainly associated with the occults, and, and, and that is pre-Islam. And, and these occults, obviously, when they do a tere, it doesn't have to be, you know, they use whatever, it is traditional, and, 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 and they give it to you, and then that's, that's what people normally use. But still, the essence of the whole tere um, um, thing is about protection for people. Yeah, and my thing always, I always thought that really, when people had them, they were not public. They were not pub visible. Mm. They would be on your body and they would be hidden. Is that correct? Yes, because um, people can place terror around their waist or their arms. And even women in particular, they have terror in their heads. Really? So, so, but these are all sort of hidden places. In, mm -hmm. in a, mm -hmm. Yes. So, mm -hmm. but, but it's for protection. Like I say, again, talking about the Islamic angle, that's the one that the Marabus, not the false one. Um, mm -hmm. the, the reason it has to be covered in a, in a sort of a leather pack, because um, for it to be allowed on a person, because otherwise Islam would say it would be um, uh, on halal to visit certain places with Quranic texts. But once it is right, covered, right, right. It's got yes, the yes, protection yes. or the security to be able yes, to. You can't have it too near personal parts of your body. Exactly, and, and but once it has the protection, like a leather pack, you can be Good. anywhere with it. Ah, I didn't yes. know that bit. Thank you. Mm. Let's go to the next image, and people can be putting. Please put your questions into the chat. Um, if you'll be putting them in now, that'll be great. So this is Andy Chirai. Um, Nicola, is there anything you can tell us that Khadija thought about this, please? Well, I thought I might just mention a bit about the uh, tintype, the wet collodion process of making tintypes, because um, it was really amazing that she chose to do this. It's, it's, um, it's as you mentioned, 150 years old. It's pretty much the oldest and first form of photography that existed. And it's incredibly precarious. Nobody does it anymore, not least because the silver nitrates that you have to use on it are incredibly toxic. <laughs> and um, so it, it's almost completely uh, not, not used any, anymore. Um, and uh, when she was, uh, all her work until this had, had been more uh, kind of more uh, straightforward photography, if you like. And uh, she went on a course at, uh, uh, at Autograph and um, on, wet on the wet collodion process. And she was really struck by the kind of um, precarious nature of, of making a wet collodion, where you put this kind of, you have to put the collodion on, on, a, on a metal plate. And she talked about it and, and then take the photo and it's, it's completely out of control, your control almost. Uh, so you can set up the scene, if you like, like, but then uh, the image itself, you can't kind of frame it and control it. And so I think she talked about it being kind of a complete act of surrender and, the, and a sort of metaphor for her faith. And, and I think that, um, so uh, e each of these images, the, the, the sort of combination of the clarity on the one hand, and then the kind of mystical sense of kind of the spiritual or mystical dreamlike quality is is kind of comes almost from that process. And you really see that, I think, um, in, in, in this image. Um, and I think that the, 
placing of the objects um, as what you know as part of that process was was um, was incredibly thoughtful on her part and every bit of her um, how much of her body she showed what position her face was whether her eyes were closed uh, you know there's only one where she's really looking at us um, all of that and, and you know how that kind of interacts with the object itself I think is uh, um, is really important and he, she has her hand very kind of firmly I think the way that the gestures and the way that she places uh, both hands in this image are um, are very very strong and and um, uh, yeah I think uh, you know this is this is a this is a wonderful image. Um, can I just ask you something, Nicola, really quickly, just off, because um, Malik was talking, we were talking about her religion and her faith. What um, faith was um, Khadija, did Khadija follow? Did she follow her mother's Christianity? Uh, and I, the both Christianity indigenous? I wouldn't want to speak for her on that because obviously faith is such a personal thing. But yes, my understanding is that broadly speaking, she, she, she went to church, but you know, she, the um, one of the kind of large photographic um, series that she made as well as crowned uh, was called Eid and it was all uh, photographs of her dad's mosque and that was really that was very important to her as well so and I think uh, as Malik said right at the beginning um, uh, very beautifully about how in the Gambia uh, religion it, it, maybe there isn't such a kind of clearly defined a separation certainly not culturally and in terms of how you practice your faith but um mm. uh, but 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 yes broadly speaking uh she certainly went to church with her mother mary okay um so malik tell us please about andy chirai and i know sometimes i think khadija spelt it maybe as one word uh with, with two separate words and it's and it's it's spelt usually as as one word is it or as two um, it is Andy Churai. It's usually made of red clay, uh, the old traditional ones, and it's associated with women and femininity. Um, people use it, it's like an incense burner, really. And um, um, then you will, exactly, you will then have like um, burnt charcoal or, or ashes where you would just sprinkle incense then that would just the smoke would just glow out easily so it, it is the different the different incenses could be to basically for odor and good scent in the house it could well be for um driving out evil spells and there are some a lot nowadays which are associated with romance and intimacy so there's a variety of incense that women really use for different purposes so, uh, so what, so what do women use for romance then? Do you know which scent <laughs> is the romantic one? Well, <laughs> I don't know the names. I, I will not want to try. It, but <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, actually they're... one of them. I know that frankincense seems to be quite popular. Um, I've, I've smelled the frankincense. Okay, yeah. Have you got any yeah. favorites? Um, personally, not really. No. Uh, okay. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't want to disclose. <laughs> But again, this is a lovely pot that we got locally in, in East London stroke Gambia. That's how we'll call it, East London Gambia. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the next um, image that we're going to go to isn't necessarily, we won't call it a traditional uh, Gambian image because uh, it's basically come from the Western culture, which is uh, Limon. Um, what could you tell us about this one, please, Nicola? Well... I, what I can tell you is that Khadija loved uh, Beyonce. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, uh, and uh, talked about her a lot. And I think she was really, one of the many things that she loved about Beyonce was how uh, kind of proud she is of her heritage and how she talks about it in her music and in her lyrics and explores it in depth. And um, uh, Lemonade had come out not 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 that long before, and I think that I think that the I mean Malik will tell us about kind of the lemons um, in terms of uh, kind of 
religious practices in in the Gambia, but um, uh, my understanding is that they were very present also in her home. So it wasn't that they're completely tied up in a sense with all these other objects in terms of kind of how she understood the purification. And I talked about the, she talked in fact about the, the sort of sense of baptism and, and cleansing in the actual wet collodion uh, process. So it's not a surprise to me in a sense that she chose to make one of the pieces with lemons that are um, kind of such a, uh, such a sort of powerful um, part of cleansing and healing uh, practices. Um, she, I mean, this is an extraordinary image. It really is, is amazing image. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, I, I think that it also is kind of for me about how she was uh, sort of holding trauma and difficulty and, and, and so on almost in her body and how these images and how she's using these objects uh, sort of on and uh, uh, her body in on the different places that she's placing them that are are kind of really an exploration for her of 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 um of her actual physicality i suppose and her own relationship with 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 healing and these objects it's sort of through through these images so uh, for me this is this is really this is an incredibly powerful image of of, of the process of healing and cleansing if you like Thank um, you. and she's wearing a white she's chosen to wear a white headdress in, in this image interesting yeah i had so many questions about her different headdresses but that's yeah. another discussion <laughs> Uh, Malik, how are lemons used in the Gambia? What is so special about them? Um, lemon in within Gambian culture is associated with superstition, really. I think that's the better word, not spirituality. Why? Because um, um, there's an element that you would believe that you would get protection. For instance, like us in my car driving, an old Gambian man would give me, and this was here in London, and 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 put me aside and say, gave me a lemon and said, put this in your car. By God's grace, you will never have an accident. So, and I had it in my car. I thought would I have it, <laughs> you know. So that's one thing in terms of protection. And then um, normally you would see. Petty traders or traders in general, they will have lemon, 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 we call it lemon, <laughs> among their goods. And this is to, to hopefully uh, encourage them to have more sales and, and, and progress, really. So these are the main two things in, in Gambian cultural angle. But obviously, for women generally, you know, like um, especially in traditional Gambian, traditional African societies, women are seen to be taking care of the homes. And, and lemon is always associated with cleanliness in mm -hmm. terms of cleaning and all that. So perhaps then again, it is fitting to, to, to see uh, women being associated with lemon and herself in this, mm -hmm. immersed herself with a lot of lemon. And and it's not only cleaning the house, but even cleaning the food as well. <laughs> yeah. really? and, and it yeah. gives it some taste as well. And yeah. um, again, I, I don't want to make it a bit sultry, but, um, there's a lot of women, especially Gambian women. You see, they like a lot of this sort of stuff, where this, whether it is ebe, just a bit spicy with lemon, a bit of, you know, something to do with that kind of, you know, Malik, lemon, lemony taste. Malik, did you say the way that businessmen use lemons? Uh, are you suggesting then that it's a kind of symbol, uh, you know, for pro or sort of superstition yes. for prosperity and bringing, or is that? Yes, a lot of these petty traders, if you okay. look at the, 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 the carrying sort of their um, baskets on their heads, they usually would have a lemon. A lemon. Um, That's yes. interesting because she it, it, did talk a lot about, she, you know, Khadija was absolutely determined to sell her work and um, prosper. Uh, financially as an artist so um, that's interesting that the lemon actually ha sort of mm. has that role in the Gambia it does we yeah. need to, we need to tell Beyonce that as well <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but 
you know that Khadija has nailed it for her. This is why she's <laughs> prosperous. Well, yeah. maybe Beyonce's known that for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> She's a bit more clued in on Africa there. Right. Wonderful. OK, so the last image we're going to look at. So I'm sorry, audience, we're not going through all nine. You'll have you can visit um, the um, exhibition online and you can actually enlarge those pictures online. You can also now the British Library is now open and you can book tickets to come and see the exhibition until the 7th of October. So this is the last one that we're going to go through this evening, which is Petau. So what do you know, what can you tell us please Nicola about when Khadija was making this one? Well, uh, Petau, it's the, it's the only image she, she's looking, she's head on and She's looking straight out of uh, at us. It's it's the only image where she's doing that. Um, she's wearing kind of full headdress, uh, beautifully kind of uh, starched and pressed, and uh, she's got the carry shells uh, that she's sort of placed on her mouth with her kind of you know her arms, which are again very she's really that's very kind of conscious exactly how she's placed her arms and I think for me this 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 image is um in a way it's kind of the counter to the first image in some ways um it, it because she's head-on looking at us and and it's it's uh, very powerful in portraiture terms uh, for me um, I think that it, she is powerfully kind of asserting herself as a black woman in the, in the content in the canon of the history of portraiture and the history of art uh, of portraits uh, um, of kings and queens this this deserves to be up there uh, with them and I hope will be because this and this for me the cowrie shells uh, which um, uh, are the one object I suppose that most of us have some uh, a little familiarity with because they're so closely associated with um, with with uh, so many countries in 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 Africa, and um, uh, so I see this as kind of really summoning up the her, the mother country mm -hmm. and her sense of being proud of her African heritage as well as her West African and Gambian heritage, and those cowrie shells. Um, uh, also, I suppose uh, uh, on her mouth there the, the the sense of kind of all her senses have all her senses um sight speech hearing touch that they've all been kind of addressed in all of these works I guess and so this for me this is her this is her voice mm -hmm. and that fantastic headdress it's almost like this is the queen of Literally, it's just headdresses there, yeah. <laughs> you know. So yeah, so this is fantastic. Yeah. So, um, Malik, could you please add to this for us, please? Petau, cowrie shells. Well, generally for Gambian culture, it is for clairvoyancy. Mm -hmm. tell us, future tell us. People visit these clairvoyants and they tell them what is going to happen to them tomorrow. Um. I wouldn't say, I mean, women are most victims, but they, they would probably just edge it out. Because um, a lot of clairvoyants, they, 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 well, I don't want to use the word, but they predict people's sort of um, marriage life, love, and, 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 and job prospects and everything. So people really visit clairvoyants and there's even I mean, that is fake clavians, but people even involved in sort of money kind of doubling with these clavianses. So in, in, in African culture, or Gambian culture in particular, clavians, they are future tellers and, 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 and it, is to related, it is related to fortune. And obviously we know that cowrie cells in history has been used as a, as a currency. So perhaps you can add all that and, and see the connection with sort of fortune and, and, and fortune telling. You know? Can I just ask you to clarify, because we've used the term marabou and now you're using the term clairvoyant. Are they different? 
well, it overlaps. I mean, there are some marabouts that are more involved in sort of clavency, but proper marabouts that people would want to call, they wouldn't do that because Islam itself um, opposed and, and, and the use of clavency. Not that it, it recognized the efficacy of it. Islam recognized the efficacy of clavency, like uh, as um, Petau, I mean, uh, she shouts that it can, it can reveal there is no doubt about that because even the prophet, there's a story where it is the petal that found out where he was hiding when he has been chased by, or he was hiding from his enemies. So there's no uh, this thing about it, but proper marabouts wouldn't use it because Islam itself banned people and, and, and opposed the use of clavians, opposed the use of petal. So people who I would call clavians then, they are not proper marabouts. Because they're using the cowries. Because they're using the cowries, yes. But then it is an African practice and it has, like I say, it's very potent. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Mm. It is very potent. That's wonderful. Oh, both of you have given such rich explanations and uh, insights into Khadija's work and into Gambian culture. Thank you. We do have some questions for you. I don't know if we're going to get through all of them, <laughs> but we will, you know, we will get through some. We've got some really interesting questions. I know some people have put some questions in the Q&A. I don't know if we've seen those. If you put them in the Q&A, please put them in the chat just to make sure we get them. Uh, there's a question here from um, Maria Amadou. Thank you for the insights for this incredible work. I was wondering what will happen to Khadija Say's work? Is it housed in a public collection? And will there be a monograph of her work? Nicola. Uh, so that is um, it, all of the estate that, that survived. Uh, I, I might say that uh, very tragically, most of her work was also in, in the flat and um, did, didn't survive the fire. So what remains is, um, is, is in her father's gift to decide uh, where it goes. There is already uh, one of the pieces, uh, Nak Bejen, uh, is, in the, is in the Tate uh, Museum. Um, and uh, the silkscreen prints, there are 50 of each of the silkscreen prints. And uh, many of those sets have been bought by museums around the world. Um, uh, so, and there are still sets available and there are still institutions and museums in the process of purchasing them. Uh, the funds, um, from those go to the inter, the Khadija Say Into Arts program, which is part of Inter University. Um, and she herself went to Inter University from the age of seven, uh, all the way to going to sixth form. Um, and the Into Arts program helps other young disadvantaged um, uh, children who want to go into the arts. Um, so, there, the other tin types, uh, to answer your question, that's uh, that's still being decided, and I very much hope uh, that a monograph uh, will soon um, come to pass. Um, and this amazing work that Khadija and Marianne and Malik have been doing will, uh, I hope, be part of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'll come back to you about the, uh, in terms of the monograph, um, having one is going to be very important. Um, can you tell us briefly, Nicola, a little bit about the title? In this space, we breathe. We breathe, mm -hmm. dwelling yeah. in this space, we breathe. Well, she actually thought about lots of titles and, uh, but I must say, uh, so I know about a lot of the other titles that she thought about and, and lots of them kind of referred to um, her faith and uh, they were all amazing titles, by the way, um, but they each one would have given the work, I suppose, a slightly different uh, lens. And uh, but this is this is the title she landed on in the end. And um, 
partly this work was um, this work was actually made sort of you know for the diaspora pavilion and that work was specifically a response uh, to that pavilion it was the first ever diaspora pavilion at the Venice Biennale and uh, you know which is like the Olympics of the art world yeah. held in Venice every two years. Mm -hmm. The David A. Bailey and myself uh, and my husband David Lammy, when we had the first idea of making this diaspora pavilion, it was part. It was sort of ten years before when we had been there, and we were so struck by uh, when you walk in to the Biennale, there's almost a kind of uh, colonial hierarchy, basically, of the pavilions and the countries that get pavilions and the order that they are in and uh, so the diaspora pavilion was a kind of response to that so I think and and uh, this each of the artists work was a response to the actual uh, space that the, the diaspora pavilion was in so I think that she was very much focused on on um, her self her uh, her becoming an artist in that place as a black woman um, a kind of uh, realizing her dreams of becoming an artist she she talked very powerfully about becoming visible and that she felt visible uh, mm -hmm. you know in in that exhibition and so I think the title uh, I think the title refers to that uh, but it's it's an incredibly I, 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 um, I can't speak for her in terms of really kind of interrogating that uh, title it, it, I think it speaks for itself it's incredibly powerful can I just ask you, before we go to the next question, you may know this, you may not, she does insist that it's lowercase i. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? If you don't want to second guess, that's fine. I just thought I'd ask, I, but I know she was very insistent on that, wasn't she? Yes, I, I don't want to be definitive about that. Uh, okay. She was insistent about that. And I, I can't be definitive about it, but I think it's really because it refers to it refers to the dwelling, the first part of it. It's dwelling colon, colon. in this yeah. place we breathe. And I suppose, uh, I assume uh, that it's it's about, uh, it's kind of referring to the dwelling on all kinds of levels. Um, so yeah, I, just I, I think it's her clarifying that, 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 that in, we, in this space we breathe is, is part of that kind of wider uh, sense of the dwelling. Mm -hmm. okay. Malik, this is a question for you. It's a very quick question. I will let people know we've, we don't have much time, but we have been told we can go a little bit over because the questions are quite fascinating and they're really good. Um, Malik, in reference to the lemons, and this is from Eve Ferguson, in reference to the lemons, isn't yassa a traditional dish? Could there also be some association with traditional food ways? Well, yes, indeed, yassa is a traditional dish. And I, I try to explain, when maybe in a joking way, that a lot of um, Gambians, obviously, this sort of um, street food, they like to do a lot of these um, lemony mm -hmm. stuff that they just quick prepare and this. But in terms of um, full sort of um, Gambian dishes, yes, indeed, um, lemon is 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 used in it's most of the, the this thing very well. So yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I will just kind of explain a little bit. I know um, Nicola, you weren't quite really gave a good uh, explanation about how her work came to be at the Venice Biennale and her work, the six that she selected. So they were in the Venice Biennale in June 27. And she was, and that's, you know, and that's unfortunately her, when the Grenfell Tower um, tragedy happened. So those works are almost like her final, this is her legacy to us, right? This is like her those final- Those six legacy. tin types, yeah. So the yeah, only yeah, the tin types yeah. that survived. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and somebody did, was asking about her age. She was 24. Is that, she was uh, 24 when yes. she passed away? She was, um, yes. She was born in 1992. Right. So, uh, Oh, 
That, I know that wasn't far away, <laughs> was it, for some of us? That's far away. And she, yes, and she did, somebody was asking, she did live in the UK, but she traveled to the Gambia often because she was with her mum and they were close and she, and that, and that culture was, was very much part of her. She was. lived there for, a, I think, over a year, year. Mm -hmm. I can't be exact, but mm -hmm. she did go to school there, um, I think, towards the end of, of primary. Yeah. Um, uh, and and then you know she she went back uh, while she was a, at art college at Farnham and uh, she did this amazing series of work um, in the Gambia uh, called Homecoming. Mm -hmm. uh, Kadia, can I quickly add to please question? Mm -hmm. You know, like about the lemony food mm -hmm. that one popular Gambian dish is tomoda. And, and oh. in the West, and, and a lot of tourists, and obviously, I guess, yeah. diasporans as well, yeah. like it so much when they visit Gambia or when they try, try it over here. And, and it is more or less just, you know, cooked with too much lemon. So, so that's <laughs> the one really? part. It's called tomoda. <laughs> you think it's cooked with too much lemon? Of course. Well, yes, I thought you might, maybe one of the things why is because um, groundnuts grow. I mean, that's one of the staple one of your staple exports. You know, yes. over here, when we, when we cook domodo or groundnut stew, we're using groundnuts from the jar, you know, whereas in Gambia, you're using fresh groundnuts and it's pounded. It's quite thick and it's quite heavy, but quite delicious. So maybe the lemon is there just breaking it down a little bit. You don't need to break it down in England because you're, you're getting it from the jar in the supermarket. It's a totally different texture. And so I think the lemon is there, helps to break it down a little bit. That's yeah. my. <laughs> that's that's your take. Yeah. And of course, I but much yeah, prefer yeah. the domoda, and that I'm out. missing the domoda. domoda. Is, is, is what? <laughs> Peanut butter stew. <laughs> yes, lovely. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a great question here from uh, Louisa um, Egbonike, and it's she is saying that as mentioned by Nicola. So it's a. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to make sure I get it properly. Uh, this style of photography is no longer common. As such, the style of photography really evokes the past, mm. specifically a much earlier er era of photography, given that at times problematic history of photography in Africa through the colonial lens and Khadija's own engagement with her cultural heritage and positioning in the diaspora. Can you speak to the ways in which Khadija invokes the past in her works? Maybe both yeah. of you say something a little bit about that. That, that's a wonderful question, and I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that she, when she, that she found uh, this wet collodion. It was, it was, it was when photography was invented. So, of course, the, it was the vic, what the Victorians used, and so at the height of kind of colonialism, this, this is the, this is the te technique that was used for photography, and it was so difficult and treacherous. Uh, basically, photographers had to kind of take a whole chemical lab with them to take photos. So anybody that had a, a, a portrait made in those times uh, was actually, by definition, incredibly wealthy. So, so, so those um, portraits, absolutely, in, 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 in the past that we might may have seen of, made on tintypes on these metal plates um, are, you know, sort of, you know, of powerful, wealthy, uh, white um, kind of Europeans, and and in that kind of colonial context, she's definitely a hundred percent placing herself in that context and challenging that um, very directly and um, and and very uniquely because it's not something wet collodion is not something that other artists. Uh, you know, there are a few people making tintypes, but it's very, it's very unusual. And so all that she brought to uh, that particular technique uh, is one of the many, many uh, kind of incredible uh, challenges for us in, 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 in her work. These works, there are only nine of them. They're incredibly deep on so many levels. Okay. Can, you, can um, I add that? Yes. Sorry. Uh, I, I, let me just say as well, we're probably going to go 10 minutes over just to let people know we're going to try and put in as many questions as possible, but we will cut, we will finish in 10 minutes. Go ahead, Malik. Okay, I was going to add that in spite of all the sophistication in this technique that uh, Nicola just explained, 
the, the portraits, they're not unfamiliar to the Gambian eye. Because, mm, sure. yes, because looking at them, to me, it's just like looking at all portraits, images, that perhaps if I was going to look at archives of Gambian photography, it comes out this way. I don't know. I'm not an expert in photography, of course, but I don't know the connection. But certainly it is not something that is unfamiliar to me, you know, how it came out, how it came out. It's not mm -hmm. unfamiliar to me. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's one question I will come back to because I think I can answer it. Um, another question here is, um, oh, there are some really interesting parallels between transitional Gambian culture and traditional Sudanese culture. My parents used dental twigs growing up. Um, okay, so sorry, that was more of a, more of a comment, but it's a nice comment. And incense in clay pots is used in many different reasons, often by women. Limes are prominent rather than, limes are prominent rather than lemons. Uh, shells are used in fortune telling. And we all love bay. Yes, I know we do. <laughs> Um, thank you, Lemis Castling. Uh, Khadija's story and art uh, is full of so much beauty and wisdom. Has it ever been considered to have some kind of sharing of her work virtually with universities internationally, historically black colleges, for example? Uh, do you know anything about if that might happen, Nicola? Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm hoping that... Uh... Uh, this uh, work that you are doing, Khadija, with Marion at the British Library will be shared widely and widely with other institutions. And, um, uh, you know, everything uh, that exists of Khadija's work is, 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 is you know, uh, is open access in that respect. So um, uh, what has been made so far um, you know, is there to be shared. Yeah. I've, I've just heard actually that a, um, a friend of mine from the state, she sent me the message that um, Dr. Remy Badamossi, I don't know if you know from him, he was, from, uh, he was at Leicester recently coming from Pretoria. He's going to be the head of the department, head of arts at Howard University. I'm so excited. So <laughs> yes, I will tap into him to say, Come on, Rami, do something at Howard University for us with, with Khadija's yes. work. I think they'll love it in, in Washington, DC. So in terms of that historically back college there from Amy, uh, Amy, Amy I'm sure hopefully we'll, we'll get something going there. Um, yes, and I'd like add that Victoria Miro and everybody at her gallery have also been doing an incredible job as well at sort of putting Khadija's work out into the widest possible um, kind of network of institutions around the world. Yeah, as it should be, great. I think there was one or two more questions. I'm just going to have a look. Um, I was going to answer the question about, because I couldn't remember in my head, the, the chewing sticks, the actual tree that they came from. Somebody was asking about that. It's a persica, something persica. I cannot remember the name. Do you know what it is, Malik? Salvador. Something Thank like you, that. Salvador yeah. Persica. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm actually, I was actually, I'm probably going to write something about it as a British Library blog because it's so deep. That information there as well is really good. There's, I think, one more question here. Um, I'm just trying to now look for it. Um, given how Khadija and her mother passed away, uh, may they both rest in peace, a clear indication of the ways in which anti-blackness renders black lives disposable. How can we read her work as a challenge to both anti-blackness and stereotypical reductionist readings of Ireland and Christianity in the African context? Um, if maybe if you can both just say something to that in about a minute and I will add something in about it in a minute. Uh, Malik, it's about, it's about Khadija's work of anti-blackness um, and basically um, moving it away from any kind of stereotype. I'm sure in terms of some of what she was going through, Nicola, it sounds from what you were saying, this is what she was fighting against. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think, uh, I mean, this work, I see this is an incredibly powerful sort of statement about, um, uh, you know, her 
her positioning herself as a black woman, uh, you know, in, in, in a canon that is, you know, primarily white, um, in a context that uh, the art world that is primarily white. And, and so the way that she um, literally positioned herself in each one of those images, I think really speaks to that very powerfully. Uh, but she also was very, you know, she, she was a fighter, you know, she was fighting uh, racism, she was fighting, um, uh, she was fighting um, sort of Islamophobia. She was very, she was very focused um, on making sure that, you know, her work and her voice was sort of contributing as, as, as powerfully and as best she could in every way. Mm-hmm. Could you want to add to that please, Malik? Yeah, I would say in support of Black Lives Matters and, and, and decolonization. That's, that's the summit of, but again, looking as an artist, obviously I am uh, um, a beneficiary of the Arts Council England. And I think they've been going the right way. If they can support more black artists, support open up more and, and taking the lead, but it all then again comes to the cause of Black Lives Matters and decolonization of Africa. Absolutely. So there is um, diversity in all institutions. It, it, it is at the heart of everything that UK going for 2021. Was it was the was the word? That's the kind of phrase that um, I, I Johnson uses. The the what's it called again? Basically, like um, uh, one big Britain, you know, that involves that includes all. Oh, so he's trying to make Britain pan Africanist now. Kind well, of. that's what he says. He that's, why they, that's why that's why we are out of Brexit. That's why we have Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did ask about, I think this will be the last thing I'm going to answer, about um, other artists that influenced Khadija. We know that one of them was RuPaul. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think maybe the, the question was asking, Nadifa Mohammed was asking maybe also about visual artists, but uh, Nadifa, she was really into RuPaul and, and maybe you can see a reflection of that with one of the images that we haven't spoken about. Which one was that? Which one was the... Um, uh, with the with the with the flowers. Um, What's it called I'll, again? I'll just put it up so that everybody yes. can see it. I've got an image of it. Tortor. Uh, is that the is that yeah, the tour? That's the tortor. Yes. How do you pronounce that, please, Malik? Tortor. Okay. Tortor is yes. But I see it like as a for flowers, really. Yes, I, I was explaining it is mainly for decorative purposes in right, the right. sort of culture. Right, right, right. Were there um, any any visual artists, um, um, Nicola, that she was influenced by? I mean, uh, many. Um, she she was very public when when she went to uh, the Venice Biennale in in two thousand and fifteen. The first time she took photos of herself in front of Lorna Simpson's work. And, uh, and and tweeted them on social media and so on, uh, seeing them in the flesh, seeing some of the artist's work uh, that she had kind of looked at and admired uh, in Venice was a massive big deal to her. A lot of the artists, um, uh, the, the Ellen Gallagher that, that, that were in the Diaspora Pavilion uh, also um, uh, had influenced her and it, that was um, a big deal for her to be actually with a lot of uh, all the artists that were in that pavilion uh, all inspired her. She talked about them all. Um, uh, yeah, but she 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 was a massive fan of 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 many kind of especially uh, artists from the uh, in the diaspora, black artists, especially okay. male and female. Uh, but yeah, Ru- yeah, but in terms of popular culture, yes, Beyonce and RuPaul, they were right. I mean, they were right up there. Yeah, <laughs> and and specifically um, influenced, you know, those two images as we as we've discussed. Um, it would be great since we're coming to the end, um, if I can ask the tech team behind who've been absolutely great. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, Brett. I know you didn't want me to mention you like that, but you've been fantastic. Please, if we can put the links up again regarding um, where, how people can book and also the, uh, the, 
a blog online um, that, that people who are, are not, who won't be able to actually get to the exhibition physically so they can do that. It is open until October the 7th. Um, also, I think they put in another link that I, I wrote about um, Khadija's work for Wasa Firi. There's going to be another article out at the end of the month, um, uh, my journal. So if you just keep in contact then you'll be seeing um, more information um, and more, more writing about Khadija's work will be shown. Um, I'd like to thank you so much, Nicola. Um, you've been wonderful giving us your time to share your, your, what you knew and what you, and how you and Khadija met, came together and worked together. So thank you for all the support that you gave her. Thank you so much, which allowed us to have this work. And Malik, um, you've been great. Thank you for giving us so much of your knowledge and uh, sharing and making us understand more so that we can merge the two sides of Khadija together, the artist and herself, uh, the cultural person that she was so proud to be, uh, her Gambian self. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. So thank you everybody for sharing this evening with us. Thank you for the fantastic questions. We got through most of them, I think, um, and this has been great. And this will be recorded, so you will be able to see it again, share it with friends. And thank you very much and have a good evening. <laughs>